Um, th thank you very much. I'm delighted to be here. Um, some of you may have seen this um, paper which was published in the Lancet from Ulf Eklund um, a couple of days ago, which showed that sitting down too much increases risk of mortality in, in some people. And it increases risk in mortality in the people who don't do very much physical activity. This is the proportion of the population who do the least physical activity. And as you increase um, sitting down, risk of mortality increases. But if you do enough exercise, so these guys here are doing about an hour a day of moderate to vigorous physical activity, the adverse effects of sitting, at least in terms of all-cause mortality, seem to, seem to be um, much smaller or go away. Um, we've got some similar type data from UK Biobank, which has quantified people in terms of strength, grip strength, and looked at TV viewing and risk of mortality. And what we see here is if people are in the, sorry, in the bottom, bottom third of the population for strength, increasing the amount of time they watch television increases risk of dying from any cause. But if they're in the top third of the population for strength, that effect seems to disappear. And that might be something to do with what Mark's talking about, muscle contraction, and people who are strong might not need it so much, and I think Paul's going to talk about that later on. But that's not the focus of my talk today. I'm going to talk about what happens over the course of a day when we do activities and when we eat food. And for a number of years, we've had a model where we get people to do exercise or not on one day, typically walking on a treadmill. And then on the next day, we give them um, some food to eat, a mixed meal, and we take blood and expired air samples over the day. And what we find typically is that if you do an exercise session one day and eat a meal the next day, your plasma triglyceride responses, your blood fat responses are lower, irrespective of whether you're lean and insulin sensitive or insulin resistant. And we've got quite a lot of data to try and understand the mechanisms underpinning that. Now we're reasonably sure that the reduction is due to a reduction in very low density lipoproteins. It's very low density lipoprotein clearance mediated by LPL, but it doesn't seem to be related to an increase in LPL activity. What we seem to find is that exercise changes the structure of the VLDL particle to make it a more attractive substrate for LPL. So LPL doesn't necessarily go up, but clearance increases because the substrate becomes better. Um, what we also find is when you have these meals that um, your postprandial insulin response decreases, at least if you are insulin resistant. If you are insulin sensitive, your postprandial insulin response doesn't seem to change very much because it's low anyway. And this is a distinction I'd like to make because it's going to become relevant later on in my talk when we look at the effects of standing um, and whether that's going to have an effect on insulin sensitivity. So a long time ago, we did a study to look at the effects of breaking up sedentary time. We didn't know it was breaking up sedentary time at the time, but what we did is we did a study where we looked at one lump of exercise, 90 minutes of exercise in one go on blood fat and um, insulin and glucose responses on the next day versus doing 30 minutes of exercise in three different lumps throughout the day, morning, lunchtime, and evening. So in the latter, in the latter situation, what we're doing is breaking up the continuous sedentary time, whereas in the, in the, in the situation where you have the constant, the single exercise session, you've got a long period of sedentary time that's not being broken up. And what we find in terms of the insulin and, I keep pressing the wrong button, um, in terms of the insulin and the um, um, triglyceride responses is they are largely the same. So Exercise, whether you do it in one big bout or, or three smaller bouts, seems to have the same effect. Now, since then, um, David Stencil and Masashi Mayashita did the study much, much better than we did. Um, and what they did is look at 30 minutes of continuous exercise or 10 bouts of three minutes of exercise spread throughout the day. So you do three minutes of exercise, 30 minutes off, three minutes, 30 minutes off throughout the day. So in the latter scenario, what you're doing is breaking up the, continue, the constant period of sedentary behavior um, in a different way from doing the single bout of exercise. And what you find, again, is both types of exercise have exactly the same effect. So doing 30 minutes of exercise, whether you're doing it splitting up um, activity throughout the day or doing it in one big lump, seems to have the same effect on your metabolic responses. Now, these studies looked at exercise or on one day and then responses on the next day. And David Dunstan published a, a nice study which looked at the responses on the same day, 
So what he, had, what he did there was had a group of people, well, people um, did three trials. They did a trial where they sat down all day. They had a, 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 a test drink at the start of the day. And then another trial where they did the same thing, but every 20 minutes they did two minutes of walking. And they did that in two different intensities, either a low intensity or a moderate intensity. And what he found was that exercise breaks reduced postprandial glucose and insulin responses to the same extent whether the exercise was at a low intensity or a moderate intensity. So what he argued was it was the breaking up of sedentary time that was having the effect rather than the exercise per se, because exercise even at a low intensity had a benefit. But there's an unanswered question there, which is what is the minimum increment above sitting that might induce a benefit? So we know that slow walking induces a benefit, but is there a difference between being sitting down to standing up? So this is a study that, that um, uh, I did with them, some collaborator, that they, they led the study in, in Leicester. And in this trial, there were women who were postmenopausal who had impaired glucose regulation, and they did three different trials. They sat for seven and a half hours constantly in one trial. In another trial, they did exactly the same thing, but every 30 minutes, they got up and walked for five minutes. And then in the third condition, is exactly the same, except for they stood still for five minutes every 30 minutes. And then when you look at the glucose and insulin responses, what you find is breaking up sedentary behavior with either walking or static standing both reduced the postprandial glucose and insulin responses. We also looked at the day after the, the next day, and what was found was the effects persistent the, the next day. They were perhaps slightly greater for breaking up sedentary time with walking than sitting on the next day. Um, and we didn't really see an effect on the postprandial triglyceride concentrations, although there was a hint that they were slightly lower um, on day two in the, in the walking trial. Now, to take that step further, if you look at the epidemiology, there is sort of reasonably robust evidence that the number of breaks in sedentary time throughout the day seem to influence some cardiometric metabolic risk factors, mainly ones related to adiposity, over and above the total time spent standing. So when you put them in the models, you find the number of breaks has a separate additional effect over and above total time spent sitting and standing. So that's something we wanted to look at experimentally to see whether changing the number of times you transition between sitting and standing over the day might influence uh, metabolic responses over and above the total time spent standing. So we had a model like this where we had people come into the lab on three occasions. On one occasion, they sat for eight hours. On a second occasion, they sat and stood intermittently 15 minutes standing, 15 minutes sitting for eight hours. And then in the other trial, they had exactly the same amount of sitting and standing. So they stood for half the time and sat for half the time, but they transitioned between sitting and standing 10 times as frequently. So they stood for one and a half minutes at a time, 10 times every 30 minutes. And then what we found is, predictably, energy expenditure was higher. So the bottom line is the sitting trial, the middle line is the, the prolonged standing, and the top line, the intermittent standing trial. And what you find is there's about a 10% increase in energy expenditure in the sit in the prolonged standing and about another 8% increase in the intermittent standing trial. And that is related to the um, energy required to actually stand up because you're essentially doing a squat and we calculated that each time you stand up, you expend about two kilojoules of energy. So that might explain why people that break up sedentary time more frequently um, have, a, have a lower waist circumference and a lower BMI, for example. We looked at the glucose and insulin responses throughout the day and we found they weren't different and I think one of the reasons for that might be these people were overweight, but they were normoglycemic. And it might be that the stimulus of standing may only be sufficient to change glucose and insulin responses in people who already have impaired glucose regulation. Uh, we looked at triglycerides, and they weren't different um, uh, significantly um, either. Um, and I just want to finish off with one study we're doing at the moment, which is looking at breaks in sedentary behavior without the standing. So we showed earlier that if you break up sedentary time, you have an effect over and above the effect of standing, at least on energy expenditure. So what we did is we put the breaks in sedentary time, the transitions in place, without the standing. 
So what happens is every 20 minutes, people sit down and stand up 10 times. So we call them chair squats. Um, and we did two trials where we had them in the lab for six and a half hours, um, either sitting down the whole time or doing these 10 chair squats every 20 minutes. Um, and what you find is energy expenditure is higher when they do the chair squats, as you can see with the black lines compared to the, to the white lines. But what we also showed, and we haven't looked at these data in a lot of detail, but the effect of these contractions seems to lower the, um, the postprandial insulin response, um, and that was statistically significant. Um, we, we haven't finished analyzing it all. Um, glucose responses weren't significantly changed, um, and the triglyceride responses weren't significantly changed. So we're just writing that up now, but I thought it was a, an interesting bit of data to, to share at this stage. I'm um, just going to sort of say that we're doing a, a, a little bit of um, work at the moment in a trial called the Stand-Up Trial, which is trying to look at older adults who have um, impaired um, uh, muscle function to see whether breaking up sedentary time with either standing or periods of slow self-paced walking um, will influence these metabolic responses and also cognitive function. So um, that one is a, a watch this space. So I'll finish off there and thank you very much. <laughs>